Shalom and welcome to our webcast entitled Pandemics, Prophecy in the Middle East. What could be more relevant? This is sponsored by Chosen People Ministries, a ministry to the Jewish people established in 1894 and for more than 125 years is dedicated to bringing the message of Jesus, Yeshua, the Prince of Peace to the Jewish people. Serving in a dozen cities in North America, Israel and, uh, and about 16 countries around the globe. Thanks so much for your patience. Uh, we are ready to get started. We needed to give a little time for folks to join us. So our guest speakers this morning, first of all, Dr. Daryl Bach, who is Senior Research Professor of New Testament and Executive Director for Cultural Engagement for the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. Scott McConnell. Scott is the Executive Director at Lifeway Research, and this is the group that has produced this uh, wonderful survey. And Scott has led Lifeway's research for um, uh, more than a decade and uh, is one of the most knowledgeable uh, person uh, in the United States regarding uh, patterns and beliefs of American evangelical pastors. And then Joel Rosenberg, New York Times best-selling author with 3 million copies of books in print, He's the chairman and founder of the Joshua Fund, mobilizing Christians to bless Israel and her neighbors. Later on, you'll hear uh, from uh, me a little bit more about an offer to get a book called The People, the Land, and the Future of Israel. And uh, it's a wonderful book published by Kriegel Publications, edited by Daryl and myself. And it speaks about the role of the Jewish peop people in the nation of Israel today and also the Arab nations, it includes chapters by Walt Kaiser, Daryl Bach, Craig Blazing, Mike uh, Radelnik, uh, Mike Brown, and Mark Sosi. And actually it will be free for you if you go to chosenpeople forward slash freebook.com and the first 200 people who ask for the book and who live in the continental US will get a copy of it. Uh, for others, if you miss that first 200, it's only 10 bucks and we'll pay for the shipping. So I hope that uh, you will enjoy uh, the uh, webcast, Pandemics, Prophecy, and the Middle East. I'm going to introduce now Scott McConnell, Executive Director of Lifeway, who will give us a background for this momentous survey and then share some of uh, the survey information. Scott? Thank you, Mitch. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I want to share with you some of the findings from this, uh, this exciting research. Uh, this was a survey that we conducted among Protestant pastors, specifically those who are in churches who are evangelical or churches that are in historically black denominations. And the survey was sponsored by Chosen People Ministries, as well as the Alliance for the Peace of Jerusalem, Rich and Judy Hastings, and the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary for their support. Uh, the way a, a survey like this uh, occurs is that, that we get a random sample of, of Protestant churches in, in uh, the, the evangelical stream as well as the historically black stream, and we call their, their church and uh, conducted a thousand surveys among these Protestant pastors, uh, which gives us a, a high degree of reliability on all of the results that we see today. Um, and specifically what we, uh, what we were approaching these pastors with were, were different questions about end times, about eschatology. And we had previously surveyed evangelicals themselves, those who were in the pews, but we wanted to understand what the leaders of these churches are thinking uh, related to prophecy, related to end times. And so a, a, a very important question for us to ask is, is, to begin with, is do they believe Jesus Christ will literally and personally return? In research, we very rarely get 100%, uh, but this is uh, about as close as you can get. 97% uh, of these pastors uh, agree, and 95% of them strongly agree that Jesus Christ will literally and personally return to earth again. And so the other item is we find that 9 out of 10 are, believe it's important to be communicating the urgency of Christ's return. And and so there's a big difference between just simply believing uh, from a doctrinal or a biblical standpoint that Jesus will return and actually saying there's some urgency to that. There's, there, it is something that is impending that, that, that will be occurring um, on some level soon. 
And, and so we see that nine out of 10 pastors have that urgency. They want to be communicating that to their congregation and even to those beyond their congregation. And some of the other questions on the survey actually give us some clues as to why they have this urgency. And uh, as we talk to pastors, we're able to anchor several of the questions related to specific scriptures. And some key, key passages that really influenced uh, the following question uh, was an episode in which uh, Jesus was approached by several of his disciples and asked, what are some of the signs of, of the end times, the signs uh, that will occur right before his return? And uh, they, they, were, they were sitting at the Mount of Olives when that conversation took place. And Jesus shared several items, and he referred to those as birth pains. And those birth pains were things that would occur before he returned. And so we actually incorporated several of those into a question, and we asked pastors if they consider any of, those, any of the following current events to be those birth pains that Jesus was referring to when he, asked, uh, when he was asked by his disciples about his return. And we see a very high percentage of pastors uh, indicating that they see these current events as being the, the birth pains described in Scripture that Jesus was actually. And, and so we, we start to understand why so many pastors are seeing an urgency of talking about Jesus Christ's return, because almost as many of them are seeing uh, literal signs today. Uh, the most common is for more than eight out of 10 pastors believe that the rise of, of false prophets and false teaching in our world today um, are a sign that Jesus will be returning soon. Uh, the love of many believers growing cold. Also, eight out of 10 pastors say that uh, that that shift that we're seeing, uh, we're seeing it uh, in many Western nations uh, that used to be majority Christian and actually super majority Christian. Uh, we're now seeing a large percentage of folks who are completely secular um, and and really stepping away from from a Christian faith that they grew up in and, and was their family tradition uh, in previous generations. Almost eight out of ten believe that uh, some of the shifts we're seeing in traditional morals becoming less accepted. Uh, are also a sign of, of Jesus returning. Wars, national conflicts are another indicator that many pastors would say, yes, that's, that's a sign that, that Jesus will be returning soon. Uh, earthquakes and other natural disasters, three-fourths of pastors are seeing that as an indicator. Um, and uh, the question continued with a couple additional options. Uh, three-fourths of pastors also indicated that uh, there, Another item specifically referring to people abandoning their Christian faith um, is a sign that Jesus will be returning. Famine, seven out of 10, and anti Semitism toward Jewish people worldwide. We see more than six out of 10, and they see that as a sign. They could pick more than one of these, obviously, as, as uh, these numbers add up well over 100%. Um, only 11% of pastors, 12 if we include the, the, those who are not sure. Uh, did not pick any of them. So 88% of pastors indicated that one or more of these signs, and most of them are picking actually multiple, are things that they're seeing today in the news that are occurring in our world today are actually indicators that, that, that Jesus talked about with his disciples uh, that will precede his return. Uh, there, there are also uh, other indicators in history that, that could, could be interpreted as, as uh, prophetic items, we ask about another one of those, uh, which is the modern rebirth of the state of Israel that occurred in 1948, in which millions of Jewish people were regathered to the state of Israel. And we ask pastors if they believe that that was a direct fulfillment of biblical prophecy, and seven out of ten pastors uh, agree. Um, we also ask them if, if they believe that that, that historical event uh, shows that Jesus Christ's return is closer and almost the exact same number, about seven out of 10 pastors, uh, point to that episode that, that occurred just a generation ago as being a, an indicator that Jesus Christ's return is, is actually close. Um, we asked those same two questions actually combined uh, in, in the survey of, of evangelicals, people in, uh, who attend evangelical churches or, or have evangelical beliefs, and, and the percentage actually was about 10% higher, so about eight out of 10 evangelicals on the previous survey, um, believe that that connect that event with prophecy, um, and, and so we, we see a high level of agreement uh, among those in evangelical and Black Protestant churches. 
So then we get to, to actually, well, how soon? And, and, and obviously scripture tells us we cannot set the date or the hour. And, and, and so we, we don't wanna be do, going anywhere close to that. But at the same time, how soon is, is still a, a question that comes to mind. And we actually find that the majority of pastors actually expect Jesus to return in their lifetime. Uh, not getting down to the exact day, the month, uh, but actually believing that it's urgent, that it is, it is coming soon. And, and so many pastors are in that place. And actually the, the, the next biggest group would be those who are just not sure. Uh, and and uh, just 20% actually believing it will not occur in, in their own lifetime. Um, as we look at, at who doesn't think so, the two groups kind of jump out uh, among some of the specifics here. Young adults, 27% of them disagree. Um, and those in larger churches, 28% uh, of them disagree. But still that, that means that the majority are still believing that Jesus Christ is going to return in their lifetime. And so it's a very common belief among pastors. And so the, 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 the obvious question and follow-up is, well, what are you doing differently as a pastor, as a person? If you believe Jesus Christ is going to return uh, in your lifetime, how are you living differently? And almost every pastor in response who was asked that question, those who did agree, um, responded by saying, I'm trying to live a holier life. I'm trying to live a life more like what Jesus described and wants us to live. Um, more than nine out of 10 are praying that Jesus would return. It's something that they are looking forward to positively that they want to happen soon. Um, and nine, more than nine out of 10 say that they're sharing this good news uh, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, is our savior um, as uh, more often than, than they would if, if it wasn't su such, a, such an urgent thing. We also see almost nine out of 10 pastors praying for Israel. Um, when we actually got to something a little more, a couple items that are a little more practical, uh, a few pastors back off, but still more than six out of 10 indicate that, that they give more money away. No, no use uh, storing up uh, treasures uh, for, for future generations that, that you don't believe will be here to, 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 uh, to use it. Um, and 16% uh, don't go, uh, say that they don't make long-term commitments, um, but, but the majority of pastors are not in that place uh, when we get to that level of uh, daily decisions. Pastors are in a teaching role. They're in a, in a role in their church that they can be influencing a lot of other folks. They can be explaining a lot of what scripture has to say about end times. And uh, more than nine out of 10 pastors, 94% say that they feel equipped to teach future prophecies found in the Bible. Uh, notice that not all of them strongly agree with this question, just two thirds do, uh, which means that a third of them uh, uh, wouldn't mind a, a little better understanding, a little brushing up on, on what scripture says. Um, and, and that's why uh, uh, you know, seminaries and organizations like Chosen People Ministry come alongside pastors uh, to, to help them um, in, in that way. Um, and so it's not surprising that a similar number as we're confident about their ability to explain end times issues are the ones who actually believe um, uh, that preaching on it is important. So we see that six out of 10 pastors say that preaching on the prophecies in the book of Revelation is important. Similar numbers say that preaching on the prophecies in the Old Testament is important. And we wouldn't be surprised if the comfort levels were higher if, if, if the actual numbers of, of, of those saying uh, that they believe it is, it's important might, might A couple other uh, prophecies that, uh, that we specifically asked about, uh, there are prophecies in the book of Ezekiel uh, that refer to another temple being built in Jerusalem. And 62% uh, of pastors uh, believe that that will take place, that, uh, that that's a literal uh, event that will occur in, in the future. And so uh, that's another prophecy that we see a, a size majority of pastors agreeing with. Uh, another prophetic reference uh, that, that we specifically asked their level of agreement on was uh, Jesus Christ returning and reigning in Jerusalem in fulfillment of prophecies to King David. And we see that almost three-fourths of, of, of pastors um, agree that, that that will take place literally uh, and, and, and in, the, in the land of Israel in Jerusalem. So connected to, to Jewish people, uh, we also ask pastors if sharing the gospel with Jewish people is important. And we see that 98% of pastors uh, say that, that it is. And uh, when we drilled down among those who, who agreed with that question, 
there's a number of reasons why they believe it's important. Uh, almost every pastor who, who agreed said that it's important to be sharing the gospel with all people groups. Uh, but nine out of 10 then went on to pick uh, a, a, another reason uh, that, that are specific to the Jewish. Nine out of 10 said that Jew, Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. So that's a reason to be sharing with Jewish people. Uh, eight out of 10 indicate that, that the Jewish people are special in God's sight. Eight out of 10 indicate that God promised to preserve a faithful remnant uh, of Jewish people. And that's another reason to share. Uh, we also see that two thirds of pastors uh, believe that Paul's pattern of first evangelizing Jewish people and then Gentiles is a pattern that, that should be followed in our lives as well. And we also see that a quarter, a little more than a quarter of pastors believe that sharing the gospel with Jewish people will, will speed up the return of, of Jesus Christ. To, to close out, I uh, just want to give you kind of a, a measure of kind of how often pastors are talking specifically with their congregation in their sermons about end times prophecy. And we see that, uh, that well over half um, are, are, are addressing it uh, each year. Um, with, with more than seven out of 10 um, I indicating that they're, they're addressing it several times a year or more often. And so this is a subject that, that is, is near and dear to pastors' hearts. We see very much an urgency about how they're communicating it and uh, a number of, of, of very poignant things that they mentioned specifically related to, to specific prophecies. And, uh, a number of additional questions that we ask that are available in the full report Okay, thank you, Scott. That was that was great. Thank you for the great job the team at Lifeway did uh, in calling a thousand pastors and having these in-depth conversations about prophecy and about the end times. And it's it's a wonderful mirror to see what some of our leaders uh, believe and and what they hope to teach. By the way, if you'd like to engage in a Twitter conversation. You can go to at Chosen People USA, and the hashtag is Pastors and Prophecy. Pastors and Prophecy. And uh, we are already getting some uh, good uh, questions. And uh, after Joel and Daryl speak, we'll be handling some of these questions. So tell your friends about what's going on. There's still plenty ahead. Uh, join us for uh, this webcast. And now I'm going to turn it over for some comments in Jerusalem. Joel Rosenberg. <laughs> Good to be with you guys and uh, with all of you that are joining from all over the country, all over the world. And it is, uh, it is a special uh, thing to be speaking about these topics um, just within uh, driving, almost walking range to the Mount of Olives and the, the heart of Jerusalem where I am. So uh, uh, continue to pray for the uh, nation of Israel as we are uh, dealing as you are with the most unprecedented uh, public health and economic crisis um, in, in multiple generations, certainly in my generation. I just turned 53 this month, and uh, this is extraordinary. Now, what's interesting about this particular uh, uh, survey that we asked Lifeway to do is that they, uh, what we, we asked them to do it, and, and this was before we knew anything that the, you know, the pandemic crisis was coming. So you, you're not hearing us refer to, well, what about pestilences in both Matthew 24 uh, and Luke 21, certainly in the Greek, and then depending on the translation in English that you read, you will see as part of the list that Jesus gives of things to watch for that will be these birth pangs. Not the end, not quite exactly right when he's going to arrive in, in his second coming, but things that will be leading up and will be preparing the world, certainly preparing the church, uh, these birth pangs, pestilences, uh, our English word for what we would uh, more modernly call a pandemic, horrible, horrific diseases, this is definitely in the list that Jesus said. So I think, we, I think it's reasonable to conclude that in the list of natural disasters, this would, uh, that, that, that many pastors uh, would see this. We, again, we, I want to be clear, we didn't ask it specifically. Um, so if, if that looks like it's glaring in its own mission, that's why. Uh, but I actually think that if we took this survey, you know, a week from now, a month from now, I, I think we would see these numbers actually grow. When we, when we set into motion this particular uh, process with LifeWay, th the reason was because those of us on the screen and those who are on the, uh, 
sort of the, the steering committee of uh, the Alliance for the Peace of Jerusalem, which is one of the organizations that has helped sponsor this uh, survey, is trying to understand how American evangelicals, in this case, I realize there's a whole globe out there, but how do American evangelicals see Bible prophecy? Where do they see the role of Israel and God's plan and purpose for Israel in Bible prophecy? How have they been theologically trained? What type of school of um, eschatology do they put themselves in, uh, in terms of what they think is going to happen in the future? And, and what do they teach? You can see uh, the stru in the structure and a lot of the questions that Scott drew out to your attention, uh, what we were looking for, trying to understand this. And, and, and what I think is interesting is when, I, so I've been teaching about Bible prophecy for 20 years and I'm not a theologian. I don't play one on television or Zoom, but I, um, I'm sort of a, uh, maybe a, uh, a generalist in the sense that uh, I love spending time with experts like those on this uh, program and then many others in the United States, Canada, and around the world, trying to understand uh, their expertise and then trying to help it make it accessible, understandable, uh, to the more wider audience, uh, again, in North America and around the world. My reason for wanting to be involved in this from the beginning was because I, I would have said that these numbers would have been lower in certain areas. Uh, for example, I would have thought that fewer pastors find themselves feeling comfortable and equipped. Um, not that many seminaries actually do more than a class or a part of a class on eschatology, uh, and my experience in traveling around North America and the world is uh, that many pastors avoid the topic. Now, again, uh, just because somebody is, is teaching some of it doesn't mean, um, you know, I, you're going to get a lot of detail on this. I'm, what, what my point is, let me rephrase that. My point is simply that um, some of these numbers were higher, and I'm not doubting it. I, I'm, I'm actually glad to see these numbers, but I do think there has been a tendency in the last 30 or 40 years for some uh, in American evangelicalism to not talk about Bible prophecy. Uh, because, and, and you'll see in some of this some, some reasons maybe why. Uh, there's, there's a significant number, more, a little bit more than one in four, see this as divisive in their congregation. So that would be a reason not to go there, or at least if you're going to go there, maybe not go there as often, or you know, so forth. So what, but, what, but I'm encouraged by the overall study, and, and, and I'm fascinated by these numbers. I'm still studying them myself. But I would say this. When we set out to do this, I would have said that we were going to have a challenge to find people who wanted to talk about this. One of the reasons people don't talk about it, pastors don't talk about it, uh, those who don't, is one, because it's controversial, but two, because some people think it's crazy. That there have been so many people sensationalizing Bible prophecy or jumping on every headline and say, ah, ah, that's signs of, 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 uh, of fulfillment that it, 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 it spooks uh, some in American evangelicalism and more broadly in the church. And they think, look, I don't want to be identified with the prophecy nuts. And that's understandable. <laughs> and you know the types we're talking about, right? Their, their websites are all glowing red and black and all their sentences are in capital letters and have 92 exclamation points at the end. And this, you know, you're like, dude, you just have some decaf, it's gonna be okay. Uh, but some people get a little spooky on this stuff or they go into uh, very serious, heretical, false teaching. So um, I think a lot of, uh, so a good swath of American, evangelical, American evangelicalism avoid this topic. What I think is happening now is very interesting. And I'll just make this point as a broad point and then pitch to, to uh, to Daryl Bach, I think that what's happening right now is so extraordinary. Uh, this pandemic crisis and the economic crisis that's that's uh, that's been triggered by it, like for example, the complete collapse of the price of oil. We are in a, a reverse situation from the early 1970s, where uh, uh, the Middle East was using oil as a weapon against the rest of the world, and prices were so high. Now we're in a situation where uh, oil producers are going out of business or at risk of that. Why? Because prices are so low. My point is there are multiple uh, geopolitical, economic, and other and social 
uh, implications of the crisis we're going on going through right now with the COVID-19 crisis. And I think what you're seeing is an increase in interest. And we have to be careful in how we teach this, that we don't jump. Uh, on the other hand, I think and what we did for the Joshua Fund, the ministry we started, you can go to look at cross-check those details, a very detailed uh, survey at joshuafund.com. But the point is we are seeing a growing interest in Bible prophecy, in a curiosity. Why is this happening? Right? It's not a foreign war. Something is happening, and God is letting it happen. And 44% and of Americans in this other poll that Joshua Fund did, 44% of Americans, not just Christians, but of all types of Americans, are saying this is either a wake-up call to return to God in the Bible or a sign of coming judgment or both. That's extraordinary because that includes atheists and agnostics and Jews who don't believe in Jesus and all kinds of others. This, this was specifically pastors who believe in Jesus. So these numbers are telling us that there's a growing interest as people try to process what they're seeing around them and the fears that they have in light of the Bible. That's an important point for the church to be identifying and to teach wisely uh, and, and, and carefully at a moment like this. Daryl? Well, thank you, Joel, and a good day to everybody. Um, I'm going to try and pull some of all this together, and I'm going to give you four words that I've heard as we've gone through the numbers and as Joel has kind of walked through what he's seeing. And those four words are urgency, pandemic, birth pangs, and sensationalizing. And as you think about what this poll is indicating, and I want to stress, this has already been alluded to, but I want to make it clear the interesting thing about this poll was that we did this poll before the pandemic really kind of reared its head. Um, these questions were asked as the as the reports of the plague were uh, coming out of China and, and hadn't even really hit Europe yet. Um, so these numbers do not reflect the reality we find ourselves in. Uh, and I agree with Joel. I think if we were to re-ask these questions, we would see them be even higher in light of what's going on. Uh, pandemics, let's talk about that word for a second. Um, that term, as Joel mentioned, is in the Olivet Discourse, or Jesus' Discourse on the End Times in Luke 21. Now there are parallels in Matthew 24 and in Mark 13 that don't mention, at least uh, in, in most translations and most of our, the manuscripts, the earlier manuscripts that we deal with, don't mention it in Matthew, although some do. So sometimes some translations will have it in Matthew as well. But Jesus did allude to plagues as a part of these birth pangs that you heard about earlier. And uh, the Olivet Discourse was designed to do two things at once. This is something that people, um, wrestle with as they work with this passage, and that is the Olivet Discourse is describing both the events that lead to the destruction of the temple in AD 70, short term, as well as describing events that will lead up to Jesus' eventual return that we call the Second Coming. And it's doing both of those things simultaneously and on top of one another, because the Olivet Discourse is what we call a pattern prophecy, where the short term matches the long term. Those of you who know your Bible well know that there's a reference to the day of the Lord in Joel, which refers to a locust plague in his time, but that also pictures the end times at the same time. So you get two events on top of one another, overlaid on each other, and you can cover both of them at the same time because they have the same kind of phenomena. This is why people discuss, you know, is this the end times or only leading towards it? I think what we can say is that birth pangs is a good description of what we have here because in this discourse Jesus makes it clear that these birth pangs, these signs that were mentioned, are actually um, indicators that we're moving towards the end without necessarily being in the end. So that, that's an important distinction that the Olivet Discourse itself uh, makes uh, as Jesus is unfolding both what is going to happen as we move toward AD 70, something the disciples themselves, most of them saw, as well as movement towards the end. 
And this leads us into the sensationalizing and the discussion that happens within Christianity. One of the numbers that we haven't heard yet is that when we polled these pastors, um, fully 60% of them are premillennial, which means they believe Jesus is coming before a physical millennium. And another 21% are what are called amillennial. Those are people who don't believe that there's an earthly kingdom, but that we go directly into a new heaven and a new earth, which means that the discussion about the end is actually a topic of discussion uh, among pastors to a degree. And fully 27% of those polled indicated that this issue can be divisive in their congregations. And so when Joel mentioned, for example, the hesitation to preach this by some, that's actually one of the reasons is that they can't be sure what their, what their people in the pews actually think the Bible actually teaches on these themes. So you put that all together and where does that bring us? That brings us to the combination of urgency and sensationalism. And with regard to urgency, I'll just simply say that the Bible addresses attention and mentions attention that it never totally solves for us. Uh, you can see this in a text like uh, Luke 18, 1 to 8, where Jesus declares that he is going to vindicate the saints soon and that, uh, and that justice, the justice of God for the righteous is going to come soon, but it's going to be long enough away that when the Son of Man returns, which is Jesus' favorite way to re refer to himself, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on earth? So there's this tension between God has a plan, it's unfurling, it's going to come soon, and of course in the context of eternity, um, many things are soon, but it's going to come soon, but it's going to be long enough that some people may not hold on to what they initially believed, or the corporate world may not hold on to what uh, the church is teaching what the early believers were teaching. And so this tension exists, and it's never resolved. The disciples asked Jesus right after his resurrection, you know, is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? This is in Acts 1. And Jesus' response is, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father has set, which is a fancy way of saying, I'm not telling you when it's happening exactly. And then he gives them the assignment to go out into the world and make disciples starting from Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In the meantime, do this. And in the Olivet Discourse, as he gives all the signs indicating things are coming near, he also says in the midst of that, keep watch and remain faithful. So that's the application that's made out of all this, even though you can't exactly determine uh, the end whether the end is near or not. You know it may be coming closer, but you don't know it's actually here and that this is it. So what this means when you boil it all down is whether Jesus's actual return is near or far away, we have a calling to be faithful to in our walk to the Lord, to keep an eye on, on how we walk in our own life, and to live in a way that is honoring to God, and to share the good news with those who uh, who need it, that is, share it with the world that is in need of what it is that the gospel has to offer. And I think that's the best protection against over-sensationalizing any kind of information that you get and any kind of speculation you get about the end. The Bible has this tension in which birth pangs are a sign of the way things are going to work as we draw closer and closer on the one hand, but it may not be the end. And on the other hand, uh, as we draw closer and closer, we're called to be faithful in our walk with God and to uh, be prepared to share the gospel with those who need it and, uh, and to not over speculate on how close the end may be, although we are supposed to keep watch. And I think that what these numbers show is, is that we have pastors who are aware of what the Bible teaches, uh, are prepared to share it. Uh, and to share the message of God, and then are prepared uh, to reflect that teaching to a, a needy world. One final point. When we look at pestilence, when we look at plague and how it functions in Scripture, what we see is um, God uses this not with a specific, I can say, signature on top of it. This is why I'm doing this. I want to tell you exactly why I'm doing this. But what you do see consistently when this happens is that God is reminding us of our need for him, our dependence upon him, the fact that we're mortal, that we don't control what's going on around us, that we're not gods, 
and that uh, we need to be reminded that as creatures created by the Creator God, we need to pursue a relationship with Him, and uh, we need to be aware of what it is He asks of us as human beings made in God's image. Mitch? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Scott. Uh, one of the first questions we have, I think, is for you, Scott, uh, because we, uh, I thought brilliantly, uh, LifeWay was able to segment the data and reconnect it so that we know what different ethnic groups, different age groups, different areas of the country believe about these matters as well. And uh, I know you call it cross-tabbing, but probably like me, a lot of us don't really know what that means. But we know that it's, uh, we're able to put a lot of the stuff together. So we have a question that I think is really interesting. Given the stats you've provided about pastors teaching more on prophecy, you have evidence of one area of the U.S. is having more interest than another. What about other parts of the world, like Israel? So I think we do at least have some statistics, don't we, about the variance in beliefs in different regions of the U.S.? Uh, this is an interesting topic really down uh, be, beyond the totals because uh, there are a lot of different factors at play. Uh, you know, some of the typical factors we see uh, when we're looking at data from pastors is the size of church is often a big, uh, a, you know, influences their thinking and the way they, they their church actually operates. Um, in this case, we also have a lot of the, theological views and end times views. Uh, as Daryl mentioned, uh, you know, a pastor's perspective on uh, how they're reading scripture, how, how the end times will play out, can influence how they're reading some of the same exact uh, passages. And it turns out that those, some of those denominations are actually more prominent in certain parts of the country. Um, and so uh, an amillennial point of view is more common among uh, Lutherans that uh, are, mo most of which would be Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, uh, the others would be considered mainline and were not a part of this research. Uh, so they would be more prominent in the Midwest. And so we'll see some trends in the Midwest uh, that, that will have a little more of the amillennial point of view, but that's actually driven less by where they're living and more by uh, their, their, their denominational background. Uh, so we, we don't see huge differences by region, uh, but, but most of those we see tend to be tracking more, again, with, with the denominations that those pastors are a part of. Uh, rather than something that might be going on in their state or in their, 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 their part of the country. Well, great. And uh, I want to remind people that if they go to chosenpeople.com forward slash free book, where we're offering a free book to the first 200 people who, who, go to the, who go and order it, and it's The People, the Land, and the Future of Israel, which is a great book, and uh, Daryl was the key editor, and I helped along on that one. It's published by Kriegel, 300 plus pages. Not as interesting as a Joel Rosenberg novel, to be honest with you, but it is uh, exciting nonetheless to learn more about what the Bible says about the end times. And right next to it, you will find a complete copy of the survey, all 100 pages. And so you can get that and take your time with it. Do your devotions from it. You'll find that it actually will be very inspirational. And if you're tweeting chosen at chosen people USA and uh, the hashtag is, uh, let's see, what's that hashtag again? Pastors and prophecy. Pastors and prophecy. So I have another question that I think is just, it must be asked by a pastor because it's, it's, it's just such a great pastoral question. And one of our areas of interest was not simply, do you believe that these various signs are birth pangs of the return of the Lord, but what should we do about them? How, uh, what, what, do they, what do they do to our soul? What do they do to our prayer life? How do they impact our stewardship? And uh, here's what I absolutely never thought of, and uh, it's, a, it's, it's not quite a stumper, but it's a, it's a good question, and I'll leave this for Joel and Daryl, and you guys fight over who answers it. Uh, how much do you think evangelical Christian pastors Christian workers, et cetera, are limited in giving Bible-based counseling to people anxious about the COVID-19 crisis. In contrast, the secular psychologists don't seem to be very limited in giving counseling to people concerned 
in this crisis. And of course, you can even flip that around. Is, and that is in light of the fact that it's either a sign of the time more specifically or it's similar to a, what a sign of the time will be like the pandemic. How do we as ministers, as pastors, what do we have to say in light of this that maybe secular counselors actually can't say? What can, what can we say that others can't say? Daryl or Joel, all yours. And that was a nod, uh, I think, from Joel. <laughs> uh, I saw that I nod. <laughs> I appreciate that, Joel, on handing that off to me. Um, well, there are several things to say. One, and, and perhaps most important, particularly if you're talking about how you minister to people in your own congregations who have a relationship with God, is there's a wonderful passage at the end of Romans that says that nothing, and it goes through a long list of things and times, can overwhelm us and separate us from the love of God, that our position in God is, is secure. Having said that, I think it's very, very important that we actually enter into the uncertainty, the pain, uh, what it is that people are going through as they lose family members or friends, uh, as they wrestle with what's going on, as they deal with the pain of, of in some cases, having lost a job, et cetera. The, the task of being relationally human, if I can say it in what sounds like a really cold phrase in the midst of what I'm talking about, uh, of having empathy certainly does exist. And we have wonderful models in the Bible of lament in which people cry out to God because of the circumstances that are around them. But in the midst of crying out to God, they are coming to God for comfort and for, uh, and for uh, a kind of peace that surpasses understanding that uh, says, I understand I'm in your hands, I'm in your care, I know you have me, whether I live or die, um, all, the, all the comfort that that brings. That's something that a, a, a psychologist who doesn't uh, have a, a faith in eternal life can't offer to somebody. So that certainly is one uh, significant major difference. Uh, the other thing that I would say is, is that in the midst of talking to people, who may not have that relationship with God. I mean, I know this is one of the contexts into which people can speak and talk about the nature of life, the purpose of life, why we were created, uh, the fact that we're made in God's image, that we're made for relationship with him, and the very purpose of what we said things like pandemics can be, which is to cause us oftentimes to be reflective about our mortality, become an opportunity really to counsel someone and to encourage them in their own walk with God and thinking about their own walk with God if they haven't been thinking about it. You know, one of the things that being sheltered in has caused everybody to do is to realize kind of what it is to have life in park as opposed to be going 90 miles an hour all the time. And in the midst of that, people are sorting out, you know, I kind of miss this that wasn't a part of my life. Even in the midst of going stir crazy, there are certain things that they're sensing about the way they live that probably will change the way they live after this is all behind us. So those would be some of the things I think I would mention. Joel, you're free to add anything that you want. Well, I think you hit it. You are the director of the Center for Cultural Engagement uh, there at, uh, at Dallas. So I, I, I agree with you. I, I would just say a couple of things. I think that uh, one of the risks is that people in pastoral work or ministry work or just individuals will jump to the discussion of judgment. I don't think that we have any way to assess at this point if this is a judgment from God. I realize everybody's free to make their own choice, but I, and, and, and does America or any country, uh, do we know biblically, prophetically that we're gonna face judgment? Yes. If you're a country that kills 60 million babies through abortion, are you going to face judgment? Absolutely, yes. We have to be sober about that. But in terms of talking about it, judgment, I, I don't think there's any way to know that this is a judgment of God. Is it a shaking? I don't think there's any doubt about it. Is it a wake-up call? Uh, absolutely, in my view. Um, is it a warning uh, of, of that things like the book of Revelation are coming, in which a third of the world dies from plagues and other horrible events? Yes. And but but to but I think that the focus here should be on compassion. It should be focusing on good news. Um, meaning the good news of the gospel, the gospel which not only brings us eternal life, if, if we were to die from this 
disease or, or, or anything else, but also the good news that there is a peace that passes all understanding that God offers followers of Christ um, that not all of us as followers of Christ experience because sometimes we're not walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. We're not availing ourselves of, of the benefits always that God gives us. But this is a moment for speaking good news and speaking compassion and realizing that there are people who do not have a job. They do not know where the next paycheck is coming from. The paycheck that's coming from the government, okay, good thing, but that's only going to last so long. And they are fearful of the, of the now and they're fearful of the future. And how are we going to reboot the entire economy and society, right? I would add one more thing. And just as a, as a, from a perspective of a ministry, a person in ministry, and that is to remember that while some of us who love the Lord and are moving, we're moving too fast, it's been a wonder, in some ways, it's been a wonderful sabbatical, uh, unexpected. But remember, there's a lot of people who have troubled marriages, troubled kids, troubled uh, mental health issues or other health issues. This is causing things to get worse. Being cooped up, trapped in, and sort of on top of each other with all the other uh, pressures, uh, emotional, physical, so forth. These, in, in, and there are many families where life is getting worse and, and they're gonna be coming out of this in a, in a sense of some desperation. Uh, and so I just think we need to be aware of that and, and looking for ways to be the church. That's my summary. The government has its role, private society, private business has its role, but the church can, only the church can communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ and show you how to become a, a disciple and what the benefits are and how to do it, because it's not easy. Uh, and we need to focus on that role and not get distracted by things that other people and other institutions in society can and should be doing if we don't do our job as the church, nobody's going to do it. Thank you so much. That was great. That was, for me, that was worth the whole thing personally. So that was wonderful. I just want to add uh, John 14, 27 to the conversation. Jesus said, Shalom or peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled nor let it be fearful. And I think that uh, that really sort of summarizes uh, that wonderful answer that both of you uh, gave. Got a quick one for you, Scott, and then we're going to actually have to wrap up. These things go so quickly, but I know that uh, everybody is on Zoom, and we don't have all the personal in-person in -person appointments we usually have, but for a lot of us, uh, we, we might need a sabbatical from the sabbatical one day. So uh, a lot of us are, are pretty, pretty busy, uh, so I don't want to take advantage of the time. And so here's the, uh, so many great questions here, but the question, Scott, is this. From the answers to the polling questions, it seems that the pastors you are interviewing are generally conservative, evangelical, and dispensational. How were these pastors chosen, and what is their demographic or age range? Great question. So the... the the, the churches that were called in order to reach these pastors were, were randomly selected uh, from a list of all Protestant churches with the mainline Protestant churches removed. So, so those in the evangelical stream, those that are in denominations that are historically black were, were kept in the sample. The random sample uh, represents those who are called. Um, you know, Daryl sh shared a couple of the, the numbers and, and they're all in the full report in terms of, of how many are, are pre-millennial. It, it is a majority, um, but there are a number who uh, hold other views on, on end times that, that are included. Um, in terms of, of age, region of the country, um, size of church, uh, those are things that, that we track and make sure and, and we utilize weights if those get out of line compared to, to the totals. Uh, so those are, are very much in line with, with pastors today. You know, now, pastors are uh, older than the typical adult in America. Just because of the schooling involved, some of them are not called into ministry until later in life. Uh, they do tend to track a little bit older than the, the average adult in America. Um, but uh, but we, we see the full range. And we see some differences on, on age, uh, where, where those who are, are older Actually, uh, it's kind of funny. Those who are older actually are more likely to believe Jesus will return in their lifetime, even though there's less of it left. Right? There's less of it left. Yeah. 
Uh, so uh, it, it is fascinating, and, and it's it, you know it's through some of that rigor in in the sampling uh, that gives us confidence that we are seeing a snapshot of uh, evangelical and black churches in America through through a, a survey like this. Yeah, I, I thought it was the sampling was superb, Scott. To review, Mitch, the could I uh, make a note on that point? Yes, please do. Well, it comes to this issue of, uh, so it's two related issues. One is I think it is important for people to go carefully through the study and look for the age differences. There are some significant differences. Um, this is similar to a, a survey that we did with LifeWay, the same team uh, several years ago, looking more broadly at even juggles generally on how they see um, the, the, the rebirth of the state of Israel, for example, and so forth. And there is a big gap, significant uh, between um, those who are 60 and over and those who are, you know, 40 and under and, and so forth. Uh, and you'll see that here, just as an example, 70%, uh, this was mentioned before, but 70% of pastors and, and evangelical pastors uh, in America, 70%, seven out of 10, believe that the rebirth of the state of Israel and the regathering of millions of Jews here to Israel my family being among them, uh, believe that's fulfillment of Bible prophecy, or if you were more precise, maybe the beginning of fulfillments of prophecy. Okay, that's seven out of 10. That's, kind of, that's amazing. But look at the difference is the premillennial pastors, those who identify themselves as their view is premillennial, 87% believe that the rebirth of Israel and the ingathering of Jewish people is evidence of Bible prophecy coming to pass, whereas only 35%, 35 percent, uh, 35 of our millennial pastors do. I would be surprised even that 35 percent believe that. But what the point is, you see gaps, and so you're going to see lots of gaps. You're going to see age gaps and uh, and not yeah, uh, uh, and, and and theological gaps. And it's important, I think, to drill into these. But I will close on this thought, and that is, throughout history, people have said, skeptics have said, "Oh, come on, you know." birth pangs, blah, 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 you know. I mean, come on, we, there's always been a war, a, a famine, an earthquake, uh, some problem in the world. You can't say that's always going to be about the end times. We are, however, living in a time when the rebirth of Israel, a major end times series of prophecies, has come to pass, or it is in the process of coming to pass, because there are things related. But let's also point out, as Daryl did, that just because something happened in 48 doesn't mean... Jesus came in 49, right? So it's important to note that we're in a different season than we've ever been before because Israel exists as a country and that Jews are coming to faith in Jesus in numbers never before seen. But that doesn't mean he's coming tomorrow, but we're supposed to live with the urgency. What if he did? Thanks, Mitch, one, Mitch, one quick point that okay, you said quick, the surveys. I've got to wrap it. Yeah. You, the, you said the survey is 100 pages. It's 100 slides. So if you work through the slides, you can get the content. It's not going to take you reading through 100 normal pages the way you think about it. So you can get through this survey probably in 15 minutes very, very easily. And okay. please share it with people. Um, and on that note, from both of you, I've been asked to remind people that to view the full survey, rewatch the video and request your free book. After we shut off the Zoom, you can visit chosenpeople.com forward slash webcast. Chosenpeople.com forward slash webcast. Right now, you can go to chosenpeople.com forward slash free book and get the book. But afterwards, to forward this Zoom and we're on Facebook, we're on YouTube, we're on Vimeo. To be able to do that, you can go to chosenpeople.com forward slash webcast. And um, there was one very interesting question uh, that we won't get to about um, how we can more effectively share the gospel with the Jewish people. And I just wanted to just give a, a thought or two about that in closing. Um, the Jewish people in the land of Israel have a critical role in the unfolding of God's prophetic plan linked to the second coming of Christ. Six out of 10 uh, believe that, and 70%, again, as Joel just mentioned, believe the Jewish return to Israel is the fulfillment of prophecy. And so, um, you know, like Tevye said in Fiddler on the Roof, next time, Lord, choose somebody else, <laughs> because a lot of this has caused a lot of trouble for the Jewish people. But there's no doubt about it that uh, Jewish people in Israel 
is part of the bouncing ball of the end times, and you, you need to keep your eye on it because so much of what God is going to do uh, will involve uh, Israel. And I'm glad to find out from the survey that 98% of pastors agree that Jewish evangelism, sharing the gospel with Jewish people, is important. Now, how can a pastor be involved in Jewish evangelism? Number one, prayer. Psalm 122, 6. One of the uh, statistics we didn't get to is that 90% of pastors uh, viewed praying for the Jewish people as something that they believe is very important. And that was wonderful to see. We can share the gospel with Jewish friends, families, and neighbors and encourage our congregants to do the same. We can create a Jewish-friendly culture in the church by having Passover demonstrations, talking about uh, Jewish people who believe in, uh, in Jesus, and by uh, helping the church to love Jewish people in an age where anti-Semitism is growing, evangelicals can have an incredible impact uh, in loving the Jewish people. Also, visiting uh, Israel when able. I can't promise you that Joel Rosenberg will lead your tour, um, but I know he'll be happy. But visit Israel when, when, when we're able, because it's an absolutely transforming experience. Then exposing your congregation to Jewish believers in Jesus. And of course, Chosen People Ministries can, can help with this sort of thing. We'd love to be able to uh, serve you by helping uh, share the gospel in a Jewish way at your church. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, our speakers. Uh, I want to thank Scott and Daryl and Rich. I want to thank uh, Lifeway Research, especially because Scott has a great team and the Hendrickson's uh, Leadership Center at Dallas Theological Seminary, the Rich Hastings family, and Joel Rosenberg for doing so much to make this survey uh, possible. Again, uh, make sure that you uh, send this out to friends and that you uh, grab the free book or else uh, get it with that special $10 deal for the book and also for uh, shipping. So God bless you. Shalom. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, we pray God's best for you during these dark times. Stay faithful, stay hopeful. He's still in control. Bye-bye. the Lord.
is great. 